Hey guys, welcome back to the DRES podcast. This is Neon, and I am here with a, another very special guest. We've got the toy guru himself, Mr. Scott Knightlick, is on. And uh, I'm excited to talk to him. Uh, Scott, why don't you tell people who aren't familiar with you why you're the toy guru? Well, hi, people in podcast land. Yeah, Neon, thank you so much for inviting me on. It's great to uh, to be on, on your podcast. Big fan of the channel, believe me. <laughs> oh, th- thank you. I'm, and I'm sorry. I am sorry. I I, I know. It's, that's what Stan Lee says to everyone. Um, toy guru. Gosh. So um, I have been in the toy industry for about 25 years. And the first 10 of those I spent at Mattel as the brand manager for lot of lines, you know, very geeky stuff, Masters of the Universe classics, DC Universe classics, Ghostbusters, Green Lantern, uh, back the hoverboard, like basically all the geeky stuff that was coming out of Mattel for Maddie Collector, if for uh, those of you yeah, who yeah. back in the day. Um, and since then, I've worked for a variety of other toy companies. I created Jada's Nano line, if you've seen those little mini uh, metal figures out there. For oh, yeah, things. yeah. Yeah, that... that Proudly mine. That was like, oh, okay. Like, like literally, like I walked in with that. I, I've never had a, had a idea literally translate directly to market as quickly and as literally as that project. So, oh wow, no, uh, that's that's really cool because I, I love those because um, you know I grew up with the uh, Star Wars micro collection. That is what I brought in for my pitch. Oh, awesome. Okay, yeah, I love those. I actually played with those more than I played with my four inch figures because you had these these great play sets and they didn't take up a oh. lot of room. You know? Oh my yeah, no, it's fantastic. Uh, and yeah, I, I had a, I mean, I'm actually looking at them. They're on my shelf. I had mine and I scooped them up. I brought them into Jack Lee's desk and I said, this is what I want to make, but for all of pop culture. And that's, that's awesome. So yeah, I was really proud of that one. So yeah, I've, I've been doing a lot of cool stuff in the toy industry. And for the last five years or so, I moved out of California, out of LA where most toy companies are, minus Hasbro, um, to North Carolina. And I have, Throughout the pandemic, I was I've been uh, consulting, doing a lot of freelance work. I have a LLC called Spectre Creative. You can check it out, SpectreCreative.com. Where, yeah, I work with toy companies, entrepreneurs, people who have ideas for toys and need help getting it to market. Whether it's branding, retail development, content development, packaging, that's what I do. Spectre Creative. So I've taken all my industry toy time and and uh, I offer it to entrepreneurs. Awesome. Well, we're we're definitely going to pick your brain about uh, entrepreneurial efforts. I think in this in this uh, episode, uh, we're going to talk about a bunch of different things. We're going to talk about obviously Masters of the Universe. That's something that's kind of near and dear to us. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, well, I guess some online drama that you've had recently. And uh, we'll talk about some projects that you're working on currently. So if you guys haven't subscribed yet, please do so. Spotify, Amazon, iTunes, wherever you found this podcast, uh, please give us a sub. Building things back up, but uh, we're looking forward to bringing you more quality content. We're going to try to bring quality content. Scott, no pressure. Uh, You know, I I have a channel too, not as big as yours. And every day I strive to have the worst possible content. So, (laughs) uh, you know, you got to have goals. That, well, that's how you do it on YouTube, right? You just kind of, you just kind of like fail upward. Like you see these channels that have like 50 million subscribers and you're like, what, what did they do? They just like, just read memes. And that's, that's how they got to 50 million subscribers. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. And versus like, you know, we have similar channels commenting on pop culture and it's like, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, slow drip and uphill battle, but yeah. Yeah. feels like, um, yeah, you know, it's one thing we've talked about, my wife and I on the channel, that it feels like we're we're kind of losing in some ways, we're losing pop culture that everybody's just kind of pulled in a hundred different directions now. Like it used to be back in the day, like you know, something like He-Man or Ghostbusters, like it was a cultural touchstone. It was you know, an event. Uh, everybody watched the same shows, we watched the same movies for the most part. Um, everybody remembers certain brands from their childhood, but it seems like now you know, there's like 50,000 new Netflix shows and all kinds of, you know, online stuff. And it just seems like kids today don't have that um, same sense of pop culture that we had. Is that, is that pretty fair? hundred um, percent. You know, it's everything you just said, plus like, you you know, the water cooler factor, as I've, I've called it in videos, like the uh, slide, of, you know, around the slide. There's no gathering around the slide the next day at elementary school to talk about what happened on He-Man the day before. Yeah. 
because everyone's binging and watching it in their own time and you know consuming massive amounts of content and then moving on and then the other thing is people stop watching their leading their lives and kids are now just watching other people's lives on yeah that's that's weird i mean i was like um my kids growing up i mean that they were probably the first like youtube generation and they start watching youtube before they go to school in the morning and my daughter especially it was like oh let's watch these these rich kids do their morning routine or whatever and uh let's watch uh the other rich kids open a bunch of toys and uh, you know that was kind of what they were watching, you know, that and like annoying orange, but I'm like, yeah, I was watching, you know, GI Joe and transformers in the morning before school. And it's a very different uh, time now. And I have to wonder if that isn't, you know, part of the reason that toy companies, and you can probably elaborate on this, they keep coming back to our generation's, you know, uh, touchstones, classics, masters of the universe, transformers, GI Joe, my little pony. It all comes back again and again, because it feels like I almost feel like in some way we were like the last toy buying generation. No, you, you actually said a lot of the th same thoughts I've had and maybe haven't articulated. It's, it, you know, there are, and also, I mean, part of it is because studios and toy companies are afraid to invest in something new because if it goes bottom up, yeah. You know, it's much better to do Ghostbusters 9.0 and, you know, another Han Solo movie. But yeah, it's, it's like, after, I mean, you know, we, there was a little bit in the nineties, you know, Power Rangers, Jurassic mm -hmm. Park, kind of after that, it's like, you know, I mean, the eighties was a very unique time, especially with, you know, with the FCC allow, that al actually allowed cartoon content, which that was a very limited window because after the eighties, Congress re uh, reversed itself. So that we had so much good stuff when the FCC was deregulated in those nine years. Yeah. It's just so weird. Cause I, I was talking about that with my wife and I'm like, isn't it weird? You know, cause we talk about Hasbro a lot and we're kind of seeing Hasbro, especially it looks like they're trying to pivot away from being a toy company and into just like an IP license holder. And they keep, you know, uh, farming out their uh, content, you know, different, different uh, publishers, different, um, you know, companies, basic fun and super seven and, and all that. And I'm like, when was the last time Hasbro made anything new? Like, I, I can't remember them trying anything new. It's always the same. Nerf, Transformers, G.I. Joe, market to 30, 40, 50-year-old guys, you know, and the toys just keep getting more expensive and articulated and exclusive. But it's still like the same group of people that bought these toys when they were 10. They're just buying them at 40 and 50 years old now, better versions of them. And that's you know, not enough to support the toy industry. The toy industry has always, you know, been on the back of kids and play. Yeah. Yeah. You know, which again, going back to, to TikTok and YouTube and you know, the fact that kids are spending so much time, what, like it's, again, instead of living their own lives, they're watching other people's lives. That's weird. I mean, it's weird. It is. It is yeah. weird. I never really thought about that, but I'm like, yeah. Cause even, even in animation, we've seen a shift that, most of these, you know, uh, shows for kids, supposedly it's usually like 20, 30 somethings watching these shows. And then they're like, why, why aren't the Steven universe fans buying toys? I'm like, cause they're probably 27 years old. That's why they're not buying toys, you know? Yeah, it's, it is, it's very, I mean, you know, I have a daughter too. She kind of is just aging out of toys into that whole, you know, teenage thing, but it's yeah, it's not like it was. I mean, your kids are growing up much faster and, you know, that's not necessarily good for society. You know, kids need play. Right yeah. Now. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's, let's talk about, boy, that took a dark turn. Let's talk about happier things. Let's talk about, you know, since we were talking about, you know, our generation kind of being marketed and remarketed to uh, masters of the universe classics was one of the first lines I remember that was basically a, an adult collector only, uh, you know, reimagining of the toys that we had, basically more primo versions of the toys that we had when we were kids, and you were heavily involved in that. Um, yeah, I mean, that was pretty much, I mean, yeah, obviously it was a team effort. I mean, the horsemen have a huge amount to do with that, with the sculpting. Mm. But from an overall, you know, if, if the line was a, you know, ship of the line, yeah, I was the captain. So, um, you know, plotting the course and making the decisions and, you know, et cetera. And, it was absolutely a dream line to work on. It was, you know, lightning in a bottle. I mean, I even looking back, I still can't believe we did what we did and like that it happened because it was so outside of the norm, especially at the time. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. I remember when they first came out and I was really excited. I'm like, man, there's like better versions of the class. Cause this, uh, if I remember correctly, it came out not long after the 2002, 2003 line. <laughs> yeah. So <clears throat> that line pretty much officially kind of, I guess, ended in like 2004 and yeah. classics didn't start till 2008, 2009. So it's okay. like a five year gap ish, but yeah, it was the next thing. Yeah. And I thought it was really cool. And then I was like, and this is my thinking back then I was like, wow, they're a lot more expensive than they were when I used to buy them at KB toys, you know, they're, but, but that actually became the norm, the, the more expensive, more articulated, um, sort of artisanal action figure line. And you're seeing other companies now, like, you know, Hasbro doing this too with uh, transformers and, you know, pulse and, and all of that. But like, how, how did that conversation start? Because I love, I loved the 2002 version of he-man that's probably my my all-time favorite version of it and it got cut short and i've heard various reasons as to why it got cut short um i heard kids weren't watching the show the toys weren't selling the case assortments i remember were terrible it was just skeletor and he-man all over the place yep it was yeah exactly I and mean, it was like a perfect storm of uh you know everything that could sink a toy line so you know, I, I, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I'll, I'll give you kind of like the uh, the quick version, but please feel free to ask me to elaborate on any of these points. Uh, so when I was at Mattel, it started in 2005. So the mass, the clad, the 2000 X line had just ended, and yeah, I was a huge uh, fan of it. And in fact, I didn't even get to see all the episodes until I was at Mattel, hmm. and I went to the audio video department, and I requested like the whole. I guess second or the Stakeman episodes, whatever that's called. Second yeah, or third season. Yeah. Like I never saw those because the airings, that was the other problem. They, they changed the time slot so much. So the first time I ever actually got to see the whole show, this was before it was released on DVD was I got, I, I had the audio visual guys burn me copies. Um, and I was like, yes, this is so great. I get to finally, um, okay. That was a total sidetrack, but it shows, yeah, that I, my pre love. Yeah. I love that show. Yeah. So, yeah, and so originally, actually, that Classics uh, was pitched as a continuation of that line because we knew we had an adult collector audience with things like Keldor and She-Ra sold a comic mm -hmm. But we, there was no kid interest um, for various reasons. A big one because they just viewed He-Man as a big naked guy, uh, <laughs> you know, versus the 80s. That was the thing, you know, muscle. Right, men. right. It, that time has passed. Kids actually really had a hard time with that one. Like, why is he running around in his underwear? I don't get it. Conan oh. did. That's that's basically it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know the eighties was you know Rocky and 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 yeah you know, yeah you know, huge you know muscular predator uh, anyway. So when I originally had pitched the idea for what became Maddie Collector, it, it um it was at the Motu component was going to be a just a literally continue making two thousand X figures mm. because we had all the tooling, and I figured like yeah we'll just keep making these because there's a fan base and then the horsemen showed up the next year with a prototype of what became classics and showed it to us at comic-con and we're like okay never mind let's do that that's yeah, way yeah. cooler so they 100 percent came up like they wasn't even asked for it. they didn't even know actually that i'd already gotten the ball rolling on doing this 2000x line online so it was complete serendipity that they were working on their he-man prototype at the same time they brought it to us at a show unasked for just to hey you know i want to show you something yeah. cool we did and we're like you know we actually just got the green light to do a collector he-man line it would be a lot smarter to start over from figure one and mm -hmm. try to start you know figure number 30 made total sense to start over as much as we all love 2000 x it was agreed we're doing something new um you know, we quickly kind of dubbed it a sort of like a updated, like perfect version of the toy you had as a child um, for the adult collector. I mean, it was 18 plus. It was only sold online. Uh, you know, it was never meant. I mean, it was age graded for kids. Kids can play with it. But it was, right, yeah, right. It, was, it was absolutely directly aimed at the adult collector. And we sold a few figures. They did well. We started a subscription. That did well. We got all the way to the point that we basically invented what Haslab does with uh, Castle Grayskull. Mm -hmm. you know, we were doing that decade before, uh, you know, the sale barge. And uh, it's amazing because we didn't collect money ahead of time. And I, I, I can't. It, it shocks me today that fan, like, because that was going to be such an issue. But fans easily just Haslab trained people to do that. So. 
like yeah yeah it's kind of weird i mean it's it's like basically it's like their own kickstarter right they're just like yeah we're just gonna take pre-orders i mean everybody else is doing it why not why not a major corporation you know we should have done that because we got stuck with a lot of castle gray skulls that people yeah. didn't pick up that they ordered so um but you know that's 20 years ago <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, but it, it really was ahead of the curve because, you know, uh, again, going back to the conversation we had at the beginning, um, that is the norm now. I mean, I look at all these adult oriented uh, toy lines, you know, Super 7 and has live out that they all have basically your business model. You know, you, you drop a couple of figures, you sell them online, you take pre orders. Yeah, it's, I mean, like we did, we, we definitely didn't set out to like create a new market or a new, you know, selling avenue, but it definitely paved the way. I mean, hundred percent for you know what's and I mean, I, I think it's a good thing because it's great that collectors are getting so much stuff. I mean, you know, I, I can't believe that Super Seven's pulling out Ultimates for all, all these brands. Like, wow, this is crazy. Yeah, I mean, I keep I keep looking at it and I'm like, man, I cannot possibly. I mean, it, it's I never thought I'd get to a place where it's like, yeah, I really have to decide on only like one or two toy lines because I cannot collect everything. It used to be you could pretty much get everything, and now because you know the the pickings were slim, right? You'd have a couple of good lines come out, and they have some good toys. Now it's like there's so much out there. It's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go broke. And I, it's I'm so expensive. Broke. It's very expensive. Yeah. Cause the figures I'm looking at, I'm like, oh, yeah, it's a beautiful transformer. What's that one? Oh, 250 bucks. Oh, sure. I'll take 10. You know? <laughs> yeah. Like, but yeah, again, that's the market. That's a, the adult market is, you know, but we have more money now than we did back then. You don't have to wait for your birthday. And no, that's, and that's what it is. It's all about acquisition and fulfillment and, you know, being able to purchase things that we couldn't get as a kid or, you know, a better version of our memory and yeah it's it's it's, it's very empowering that's what the oh yeah yeah because yeah. I, I know like uh you know when i was a kid i always wanted certain play sets or certain you know and it's like i could never get them and i'm like you know i can i can go buy uh the uss flag now i can go buy as many castle gray skulls as i want you know you uh, you could i won't stop you yeah yeah <laughs> so if you got a leftover you know, talk to me after the show we'll 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 make a deal um so Let's talk about it. We're going to do kind of a whirlwind tour here. Um, so Masters of the Universe in its current state. Uh, can we can we talk about controversy? We can talk about everything. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, please. No, no, you, no rules. You uh, uh, said about, oh, my God, it's been, what, about a year now, about eight months ago, that you felt like the train was pulling into the station with Masters of the Universe at retail. Yes, which turned out to be completely true. Yes. I just got the reason wrong. Okay. So what so basically, and I mean I'll jump right into the the mud because I can probably explain it easier too. So yeah, I, I basically found out from multiple independent sources, you know, different clients I have, different, you know, mm -hmm. toy distributors, that they were contacted by Mattel and told that. Uh, they should buy more Masters of the Universe origin figures because Target and Walmart weren't taking the line. I interpreted that, that they were dropping the line. Okay. What it turned out was they had so much stock of like Wave 4, the one with Naked Stratos. Yeah. That they weren't going to order any fresh product. So it wasn't that they were dropping it, but they at the same time, they weren't going to be supporting the 2023 fall lineup mm. right which is why mattel contacted all of the secondary distributors the comic stores you know the entertainment nurse big bads saying hey since walmart and target aren't taking this you might want to double down on your order because yeah. people are going to be looking for this stuff so that's what the memo was i just misinterpreted it to say they were dropping it it was not dropping it was not taking I mean, that's kind of, you could see this fine line. You're not, you're not fired. We're not renewing your contract. Yeah. Th yeah. That's yeah. so, so yeah. people were very quick to be like, see, you know, Motu's still hanging on the pegs. Toy guru was wrong. He was wrong. He's a liar. He's a liar. But I'm like, <laughs> the toys that you're seeing on shelf are four years old. Yeah. When yeah. There is, you know, there won't be a fall 2023 lineup at mass retail, which there wasn't. No, it's, it's um, like, you you were right, and I know I, I got flack because I think we we covered that too. I basically said that felt like 
Masters of the Universe had a chance to come back properly. And for various reasons, I think they kind of they shot themselves in the foot with it. Um, the CGI show, which I actually like quite a bit, didn't do very well. But those toys are all they're all sitting at Ollie's now. They're on clearance. And um, that's you, the line that should have done the best, the kids line. There were fun figures. I actually reviewed. I bought some at first. I wasn't sold on the art style. I'm like, no, these are fun. They're chunky and they're they they have action features. And I'm like, this these this is actually a line for kids. And the show is, is great for kids. I thought. Oh, the show is so good. It was uh, so well done. And I was like, yeah, all right, this is. But then when that was the first one to fall, I was like, all right, it's over, because you need the kid line to support the collector lines, which sort of become branches in the planogram. Yeah. And with Origins, they did way too many characters way too fast. Yeah. And so now they're doing like, you know, crazy, stupid repaints like the like the Stratos, the naked Stratos. And yeah, and then, yeah, I mean, the whole Kevin Smith thing. I mean, you guys were obviously into <laughs> that. But, you know, but, but, I, oh my God. So that thing, we, we are still, I, I swear to God, like, I don't even, I don't even really think about that often. We have got people that are still mad at us. I mean, we're going on, what are we going on? Like three years now, four years now. And since the show dropped, it's been what? Like three years. I think it's been about three years. Okay, yeah. And they're still mad at us. They're still like, well, he technically didn't lie. I'm like, I didn't say you lie. I'm just like, I had, I had, I was, I looked at the script. I saw it. I know where it came from. You'd be shocked. I'll tell you after, I will tell you after the show where the script came from. And, and you may be surprised. Or I may not, because I actually know a lot of the people who worked on okay. that. When I saw it, I'm like, I knew exactly. I'm like, you did that, you did that, and you did that. <laughs> um, um, but yeah. yeah, I mean, it's just the. I don't know. We still get. We still get. So I, I can totally see you getting crap for the toys because I, I think really like Masters of the Universe collectors are very passionate, and I think they're also not used to being thrown a bone as often as say like transformers fans or, you know what I'm saying? Or my little pony fans where like Hasbro is always bringing stuff back, but you know, Motu, it seems like it goes dormant for years at a time. And then it comes back. And I almost feel like people are getting so upset about this. Like, no, this is our time to shine. Like, this is it. This is, you know, masters is back, man. And uh, it just did not go as well. I don't think as in my personal opinion, as, as it could have. But. No, and I, I mean honestly, with all the drama with the Kevin Smith and the and the Revolution show, and honestly, none of that mattered because the CGI show had to work. It was all about that. <clears throat> Every, I mean, the, the 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 adult collector show, the Kevin Smith show, and the line on top of yeah. that were just you know icing on the cupcake. Retail is interested in the cake, and when they lost the cake, yeah, it, like I mean. All the drama with Kevin Smith, and I totally I follow, I, I get it, and I get there's opinions on both sides of the aisle. But much like at the end of the day, you were right, and you know this whole like technically correct is the best kind of correct. But same thing, I was also right. I said there wouldn't be a yeah. fall 2023 line at mass retail. Everyone gave me like you know horrible stuff over it. It turned out I was a hundred percent right. I just was wrong about the reason why. But that's yeah. not like you said, you're fired. Uh, now please resign or whatever. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, we're. Oh yeah, you're technically not. We're, we're just downsizing, and your your job has been uh, outsourced to India or something. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you're, you're still fired. fired, but you're not fired. We just don't have room for you at the company anymore. They're exactly. trying to be nice. Well, we knew some stuff was up because um, I don't talk much about it on the channel, but we we may or may not dabble in uh, retail operations ourselves, and we had uh, a bunch of Motu figure orders canceled from our distributor. And this wasn't long after you said that you thought the line was pretty much on its way out. It was weird. We had a whole bunch of new figures on order and we actually had, uh, we have some diehards that want those figures and our distributors like, yep, we're just, we can't get them anymore. That's they just pulled the plug on it. And I'm like, uh, why is that? And there's no reason just that they're not making them available. Then they'd show up on like, entertainment earth or a big bad toy store and you'd have to buy the individual figures can buy the cases which i thought was kind of weird but that's i mean that's basically what happens with when a line you know when the content dies yeah and because the, the the product line is in development so early and you know it's like it's the same way back in the 80s things like megator and titus showed up in germany mm. in the uk that you know because 
they yeah they'll, they'll eh, they basically plan for the best but when target and walmart basically said oh nope we don't need any more we're not we we were still sitting on you know spring and last fall we don't need you know fall 2023 product mattel bases all of their production well all companies has bro i mean i'm not throwing mattel under the bus they all base their production numbers on assumed retail orders so when a line doesn't perform at retail and retailers pull out like dominoes just fall in every direction and things just go haywire like crazy because there's you know yeah they've got contingency plans but it the plan was to be at target and walmart and when that fell apart yeah you know like because they can't go into production without these quotas and they think they right. have it yeah i mean that, that's like uh you know i remember with the uh, 2000x line you know the last series was dumped off at aldi grocery store of all places like that's that's where you found and those figures go for a ton of money now because a lot of people didn't have an aldi back then but uh yeah i remember walking in i'm like wow these are like all the figures i i would have seen at walmart but they're here in the grocery store that's weird yeah because when they get stuck with that inventory you know they'll they'll anyone like anyone will take this australia done you know ollie's done someone please like get this i think you made a video about like hasbro having like two warehouses full of unsold oh products. my god yeah they've got i mean hasbro with ollie's and and uh i almost said big watts but uh no uh ross dress for less is another one they're just dumping product i mean i i just really feel that i mean it's just a, this is a gut i am not a toy guru i'm not an insider but it just feels to me like they do not want to be in the toy business i think they'd rather let super seven or basic fun or one of their licensors you know licensees take the chance on manufacturing stuff and probably in smaller batches and it's still worth it for them but when you're you know multi-billion dollar conglomerate like if you can just license it out and let somebody else do all the grunt work why not? You know, they, they've been hit with a lot of content that has also underperformed. Yeah, you know, in the last few years, and that catches up. I mean, you know, yeah. Do you think the um because the kid the kid show God it was so good it, it was so good and I saw where they were taking it and um apparently they were gonna you know bring the horde into it and they were gonna go back to Earth and I'm like okay that's a little you know Motu you know eighty seven or whatever but but do you think if it had been on maybe broadcast television a network instead of netflix it would have had a, a, a wider reach well i mean to be honest my philosophy with content especially content that is um created to sell toy product should be put out there for free to on every possible channel like star wars should be on youtube yeah i mean like when people watch the content that's when they, so it's like yeah, I mean, restricting something to just one streaming service versus if they put out the the CGI show on YouTube mm. it was like, for free, like, why not? It's just yeah, sell the toys, so why not make it avail? Show the commercial to as many people as possible. Well, I think they're you know, I mean, they could be trying to recoup their production costs, which are considerable, you know, for the stuff. But I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I'm being obviously, you know, pious. yeah, yeah. Well, no, no, no. I know, but I'm just thinking like because I thought that was kind of weird because I've noticed that kids shows that are Netflix exclusive don't seem to get the traction that something on like you know, network TV or, or YouTube or, you know, even the Disney channel, you know, a couple of years ago when it was more popular, it doesn't seem because there's so much on Netflix. I mean, you have to wade through the bog to be able to find anything unless the kid knows specifically, I want to watch He-Man. Well, how are they going to know about He-Man? Well, well, I saw it on YouTube. Well, no, you didn't, <laughs> you know, no, you didn't. But I mean, it goes back to what we were kind of saying in the beginning that there's just so much content out there and yep. there, people are watching it on their own, binging it at their own time. You lose that communal aspect of everyone talking about what happened on LA law last night. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're going to go back to that though. I know we just did a video yesterday and uh, you know, all, all these studios are admitting they spent way too much money on content that nobody was watching. So I think there are going to be a lot more, uh, you know, judicious in their, their spending. And it might be that, you know, because back in the day, it was a toy company is a lot of times foot in the bill, right. For the production. So many times. Yeah. Yeah. It was just a half hour commercial and that's fine. And everybody, everybody takes a dump on it. And I hate that they, all these people, uh, you know, working for these different publications are like, Oh, they were just half hour commercials. I'm like, yeah, but you know what? All those properties are still around today. Aren't they? 
well, and here I'll, I'll even one up that because I, I love when, I mean, not love. I, I, yeah, he, I also hear that all the time. Like, Oh yeah. You know, he, these were just 30 minute toy commercials. Mm -hmm. So you would rather have the kid just watch, you know, YouTube or movies instead of something that's going to then have them go play with toys and have create, isn't it a good idea to sell them toys that are going to engage in open-ended imagination based play as opposed to watching something that they're just brainlessly watching other people's lives. Yeah. I mean, there's, there is a developmental need for toys and those shows. It's probably why our generation is so strong because we had so much imagination based toys. We could go up and play with castle gray skull and the flag and the thunder Lay, you know, cat's layer. And I mean, the, yeah, they were, they were commercials, but they were commercials that inspired play. Uh, yeah, because I mean, then we would go outside. We actually would go outside. We'd play with our our GI Joes in the dirt. You know, right. that's what or I you, used to do. Or you'd yeah. role play as them. Yeah, you know? yeah. Like, it's like these shows provided kid, you know, or you know, something a, a child could understand to create story structure around. Mm -hmm. It was a good thing. Like, yes, these were commercials for toys, but they inspired our imaginations. Like, I don't know. That, that's always my argument to that that can phrase. Yeah, it's it, like I said, if they weren't, if they didn't mean anything, if they weren't important, uh, none of these franchises would be around now. And a lot of people complaining would jump at the opportunity to work on a reboot or something, you know, or deconstruction of, of you know, something that we grew up with. It's like, no, nah, you're just being cynical. It's like it, it meant something to us. And we, we did have uh, I, I think we had more of a, a compass, a moral compass, even from I mean, I know it sounds cheesy, but even shows like He-Man where. You know, He-Man was basically our generation's uh, Superman Wonder Woman because there was always a moral lesson at the end of, of He-Man and She-Ra. And, uh, you know, a lot of those PSAs, as cheesy as they were, they still stick with the kids that grew up with those shows to this day. You know, everybody knows with G.I. Joe, knowing is half the battle. Yo, Joe. You know? <laughs> that line's actually in my book. There you go. So let's um, let's move on to another controversy. If Yay! And then we're going to talk about your book because that's another controversy. Man, you're just like I know, I know than I am. I, you know, I, Oliver Stone has nothing on me. Uh, so we're talking about toys. We're talking about uh, the toy industry. You had a situation pop up a couple of weeks ago with YouTube where you were getting all kinds of copyright strikes. I guess for posting photos of toys. Yeah, the the short short version, to paraphrase Spaceballs, is. Um, well, yeah, I, so, okay, well, first I got, I mean, the only way to tell the story is to tell the story. So I got 30 strikes in January from one person. Okay. Uh, well, the whole thing has been from one person. Uh, yeah, that's, that's bizarre. It's, it's, fig it's figures in question. It's a fan website. I mean, there's no reason I can't talk about it. It's out there. Um, and the person who runs it, Ethan Wilson, he's got his, I mean, his contact information is on the website. It's public. So yeah. you know, it's not like I'm giving that out. Um, you know, he's got his name and his email right there on figures in question. All right. So I get 30 strikes from him in January. I had taken a couple weeks off from YouTube to finish up my book, right? Um, which I know we'll get to. And I wasn't even like, look, I wasn't even going on to look at the comments. I like, I needed to dedicate my time to finishing this. So mm -hmm. In those two weeks that I was literally ignoring YouTube, 10 days went by. I didn't respond to the claims and my channel oh, was like, oh my God. like a yeah, race. Yeah. From its, like I didn't know anything happened until people started emailing me out. Scott, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. Where's your channel? I don't know. What do you mean? Where's my channel? It's on YouTube. So I'm freaking out because, because the channel's now gone and I missed my 10 day window. <sighs> because I wasn't because I wasn't monitoring YouTube like a hawk, which right, now right. I do. Now I, every day I check to see if I have strikes, which is a terrible habit. Um, so basically, I didn't even have any avenue to go through YouTube to get it back. I had to convince Ethan to remove his strikes. Okay. Luckily, I did. I literally begged and groveled, and in the end, he had very specific requirements that I post very specific things on Facebook. What? Which I Fine, whatever it takes. So I did that. Total yeah. blackmail, 100% blackmail. It wasn't like foot pics or anything, was it? Wasn't no, no. He just wanted me to make some statements about like 
uh, junk man and like other YouTube videos and like, I oh, was for God's sake. Well, th that's how I, I found out about was actually that junk man um, wrote me and told me that uh, you were having some problems. And, and he was like, well, is there anything? Cause you know, we talk to people at YouTube sometimes and I'm like, I, I can't with somebody else's channel. They won't even, they barely acknowledge us. You know? Yeah. Oh God. They won't even like, I don't exist. Yeah. Um. So luckily that first time Ethan was willing to take down the strikes and I said, look, I'm a nice guy. Like, tell me if there's a video that I've used your content in, I will remove the video. Yeah, I will yeah. edit that content out. I will, I'll take it down until you reapprove it. Um, and he was like, oh, you know, thank you. That sounds great. I said, just let me know what content is yours and it would be great. Can you also just forward me your copyright information? Um, you know, much like my book, I register, I mean, that's registered with the U S copyright office. I have a registration certificate for it. I paid right, a lot right. of money for that. Yeah. Um, you know, cause I wanted to own my, I got the Disney deal, my life plus 90 years. All right. You know, I, registration's a big deal. Oh yeah. So he never got back to me, never got back to me with a list of videos he wanted me to look at just nothing. I was like, okay, well, I guess he's just, you know, whatever we'll part ways. I got my channel back. That's, that's all that mattered. Another day goes by and then I had like, no, it was 63 more strikes all from him. All of these what? are, they were all still images of a single toy against a white background that I'm, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I talk about toys all the time and a lot of times I'll grab an image. Right, right. If I know where it comes from, like Rebel Scum and Bantha Skull do great work on Star Wars 3 and 3 fourth. Yeah. And I'll always be like, yeah, I grabbed this image from Bantha Skull. They're a great site. Check them out. If ever an image, you know, it, like for the past five years, I've never, I haven't gotten one strike. I got one for using a John Williams note. And I was like, oh, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. But I quickly removed the John Williams. Yeah, music. yeah. I mean, that was just an accident. Um, but every time I've used a photo of someone's collection, I've always gotten me like, oh my God, you use my photo. That's so awesome. And I'll be like, yeah, I'll credit you too in the, in the list. I'll say, yeah, and photo at three minutes is, you know, is from blah, blah, yeah, blah. Yeah. Blah. Or I'll even say, I'll make a, you know, I'll, I'll do a whole video. And I offered this to Ethan. I said, I'll make a video about your site and like say how great it is that there's all this cool photography. I mean, in a way it's like product placement. It's free advertising for his site. You know, if you, if you get a Coke can in a movie, that's awesome for Coke. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I had 63 more strikes. My channel wasn't removed because I immediately appealed them as opposed to what happened in January. Where right. I right was off the channel for those 10 days. They only give you 10 days to save your soul. Um, so I basically appealed them, but because I had so many strikes, I couldn't, I, my channel was up, but I couldn't upload videos or release videos in my queue. Cause I have about 60 days worth of videos in my queue usually mm -hmm. and that are, you know, just get released. And so all of them were frozen. Nothing got released for about a month. Finally. So what, so I appealed, he, uh, he reappealed, I reappealed, and then finally he had to either, he had to basically take legal action against me or drop the case. Like YouTube basically was like, shut, you know, uh, put up or shut up, basically. Yeah, yeah. Like, prove yeah. that you're willing to fight, you know, if you can't produce registration, then you have to take legal action. And he obviously didn't. And so because he didn't take legal action against any of those, YouTube dropped every single one. And then a week later, I got five more. And then last Saturday, I got one against a thumbnail. What? Not a video. I got a strike, a full copyright strike with video taken down based on content in my thumbnail. I don't even know what it was because I can't see the thumbnail anymore. The, so, yeah, this is a thing that is really irritating with YouTube. I mean, you know, they basically shoot first and ask questions later. So they will 95% of the time they will side with false flagging and stuff before they get around to getting a human to actually review it. And it's one of the biggest problems I think with YouTube right now, because people can abuse it. You can have, you know, a couple of crazy stalkers just constantly false flag and downvote uh, videos. And we've, we've had that we've run into that before with people like if we would uh, cover a certain topic they don't like or something or take position they don't like that, you know, we, we would see that uh, those videos would either go yellow, get 
held for a while or, you know, get taken down. Um, nothing in the copyright area, but there, there's definitely some shenanigans going on. And I, I just can't believe that, that YouTube, like if they know it's this one person be like, yeah, you know what? You're not allowed to flag any more videos. Cause <laughs> it's just well, crazy. You know, and, and let me state, I get where he's coming from. I respect, you know, that he took the time to photograph these figures yeah. The, the thing is, from a legal standpoint, you know, if you take a picture of, you know, Spider-Man, you don't own, I can't sell that because you can't, Marvel owns that. You don't have uh, yeah. to that. You, you know, you could say, I took that picture, but you don't have the right to monetize that picture. And, yeah. Sorry. Oh, no, I was going to say, you're not technically the, I mean, you, you might have taken the picture, but you're not technically the copyright. The copyright, holder. exactly. Yeah. So yeah. I get where he's coming from. And I, and I, you know, I, 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 this was never, I, it's not like I'd used his pictures to hurt him. I just feel like he could have written to me, called me directly. I'm really easy to get a hold of. SpectreCreative.com. My direct contact information is on there because I use it to get clients. I want people mm -hmm. to contact me. Um, he had, you know, and we were like, just come to me. We'll talk. We'll figure something out. I can help promote your channel. Like my YouTube channel is probably bigger than your fan site. Like, let me help you. Um, but no, he just like keeps sending these even after 93 of them were found invalid, he keeps sending more. That's wild. Yeah, uh, It sounds like there's definitely, uh, I don't know. I don't know the guy, but it sounds like there's definitely something else going on, like and, mentally and, and, there. And most of the images are on screen for an average of three seconds, and they're not the subject of the video. Or, yeah. You know, they're just like, I'm referencing like, you know, oh, and you remember Admiral Akbar had red skin? I'm showing a picture of an Admiral Akbar toy. Okay, now let's go back to what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah, that, I mean, that, I would actually argue that would constitute fair use because you are allowed to, you talked about John Williams, you're allowed to comment on a Star Wars movie trailer as long as it's transformative. You know, you have to, like, the, I've had people take our videos and they've, you know, ripped us to shreds, but they've, they've taken our videos and they've commented, but they, they took our video and they would, you know, play about 30 seconds of it. And then they would add commentary. As far as YouTube is concerned, that's considered transformative. hundred percent. And which yeah. is what, you know, again, and I mean, we'll get into this. If we're talking about my book because of the whole, you know, ownership issues, but I respect copyrights. Absolutely. And I would, I would, it just, I did reach out to him. I'm like, how can I work with you? I didn't, you know, purposefully try to violate your right, right. own material. If I inadvertently did, how can I make it right? And radio silence, strike, strike, strike. That's weird. That's just weird. I mean, we had we had something similar uh, actually happen with oh, Mattel. And if you can't uh, if you can't comment on that, that's fine. You wouldn't know what was going on. But we had um, one of their lawyers reach out. <laughs> one of their lawyers. One of their lawyers, uh, yes, one of their legal people, uh, reached out to us. It was about 15 years ago. My wife had another blog. We've been running websites and fan sites for about 15, 20 years now. And she had a site and she was uh, covering the new Monster High dolls. She were huge. I mean, we get all kinds of traffic on Monster High articles. Well, she found some photos off of a forum um, of a doll that had not been released yet. And she made the mistake of posting an article. Uh, uh, we thought we could, cause she's just reporting on it. Right. Well, uh, Mattel actually contacted our ISP or whoever this, this attorney was, you know, working for them, contacted our ISP, did not contact us and actually had our shite our, our site shut down until we removed those images ourselves. And, uh, at that point, I think we were hosted in the U S and after that, I immediately moved all of our websites overseas to the Netherlands. So there, you can't, you can't do a DMCA takedown request. So I'm like, you're going to have to go through me and you're going to have to ask me nicely to take the photos down. We did have a situation. We had a situation like that with uh, Paramount on uh, one of our blogs and the new Ninja Turtle toys. And again, it was from a forum. One of our writers put the pictures up and they're like, oh, we're going to do this and that. And I'm like, well, if you say the magic word, if you say, please, I'll, I'll take the photos down. It bothers you so much, but I have no legal obligation to do so. Yeah, we're all nice people. No one's yeah, trying yeah. to like exactly. I just ask. <laughs> yeah, just ask. And that's, you know, nine times out of ten, that's you know, all it takes. But it's yeah, it sounds like there might be something else, some sort of personal axe or something this dude's got 
with you. Uh, you know, I don't know. In a past life, I you know killed his son. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's like oh, hate that but, guy, that toy guru. He whatever I did, that. honestly, Ethan, I apologize because I don't know, but I think he's run out of videos to flag at this point because he's now flagging thumbnails. So, oh my I'm god, like, That's I just assume a- we're done. So I think that like I was hoping that was like the last gasp when on Saturday I got a thumbnail. Wow. So, okay. Well, never use his site. Never mention his site. Never go to his site. Tell other people not to go to his site because if you go there, uh, apparently bad things are going to happen to your channel. Uh, but well, you got your account back, yeah. right? You're good. Oh yeah. I, I got not only did I get it back, but just today enough of the strikes because it they have to ro- go through YouTube's like appeal system, which right. takes like anywhere from 10 to 25 days. Yes. And literally just this morning, enough of them fell off that I now have complete, like I still have a few strikes, but they don't affect me being able to upload content. So I can wait for those ones to fall off or finish going through YouTube's appeals process. It's not as much of a critical thing because they're just there. And it just means those four or five videos just can't be seen by people right now. But yeah, you know, if he were smarter, he would, he would claim monetization on those videos and he would just get all your money and uh you know but but the idea. oh yeah the, the 25 dollars yeah. that i make yeah him. well he can go buy himself some new action figures to take pictures of on a white background i guess i don't know hey you know those white backgrounds are are hard to get these days they are uh yeah. they are they're like so <laughs> so i was gonna say he could he'd get one hasbro figure at retail or he could get like 50 of them at ollie's for 25 bucks Ooh, what do you so, do Choices. Yeah, I don't know. Um, lots of choices. So let's let's move on. Let's move on to the next. God, it's just all controversy with you, man. Hey, you know, controversy you makes, makes, you, makes you popular. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Uh, let's talk about your book. You're you're working on a book, and uh, you, you're you're afraid you're going to whack the beehive with this book. Yeah. Well. Uh, yeah. I kind of knew. Well, going. I mean, I. Okay. Yeah, where do you even start? So. Um, I just published my book. It's on yes. Amazon. It okay. is called Myth Wars. Okay. Super easy to find. Uh, Amazon search will bring it right up. Google search will bring it right up. Um, and yeah, there you go. Um, no, wait, that's not it. We're going to find it. We're, We're going to find, find it. it. There we go. There we go. Woohoo. Myth Wars um, Volume 1, Zeus, The Teenage Years. So this is a book that I originally wrote in... 2005. Okay. I wrote it as an animated series similar to Masters of the Universe 2000X and Justice League. Yes. Pitched around Hollywood, made it pretty far actually, got to Warner Brothers. I wound up going to work for Mattel and as a caveat to that, no outside projects. So I shelved it, which is totally fine. I respect that. Well, here I am years later. um, After I left Mattel, I hired Axel Gimenez to draw all of the characters so i can okay. have concept art he was the artist he does all the origins um card backs okay okay and, and he and i worked together on the motu mini comics at mattel so uh so i i wanted to i basically wanted him to pay him to draw the whole book uh, i could not afford that so i basically paid him every cent i had to do as much work as i could afford which wound up being um, renderings of all the main characters plus that cover image that, um, of the book. That's by Axel. Okay. So I also actually offered him 50% ownership to draw it, but yeah. he just could not squeeze it into his schedule to do it. Yeah, yeah. So I said, totally, I respect that. Like, I'm not going to force you to draw my book. I just think your art's beautiful. So I shopped that around as well with his art and my script. Getting a comic book made as a writer is really hard. Yeah, it's, it's hard getting a comic book made in general, but yeah, he has a writer, definitely. I mean, if you're an artist, at least you can show, you know, like if you're like Jeff Smith and you can write and draw, you yeah. know, yay. So I had Axel's art to show what I wanted it to look like. I had my script, which I was very proud of, but people are like, yeah, no, we're not like, you'd have to find an artist. Like, I don't have any money. I paid every cent I had for, right. you know, concept art. So fast forward to this year, and I'm finishing my MBA at University of North Carolina, Greensboro. And Mm -hmm. one of the classes I took in December was on using AI for business purposes. And so I'm playing around with chatbot. 
I have like the upgraded version that lets you do images and analysis that I had to pay for for the class. So I so since I had access for this for the, for the month, I was like, I wonder what would happen if I asked it to draw a Myth Wars character. And I was like, wow, that's actually really close to like what I had in my mind. I wonder if I could like draw a couple panels. I wonder if I could do a couple pages. Yeah. Whoa, yeah. this is actually coming out really nice. I was blown away. I mean, it took every panel had to be rendered at least 25 times, some up to 100. AI is really hard to work with to get it to draw exactly what you want. It's not like you could just take a script and say, draw this. Yeah, it's not quite there yet, but it is It is um, evolving uh, at a very quick pace. In fact, I, I did a video yesterday talking about DC Comics that uh, artists now are sort of uh, participating in witch hunts to try to figure out who's using AI and who's not using AI. Um, because I think there, I think there is a fear, um, you know, with artists of, of being replaced. But um, I think as an artist myself, uh, actually, my background was in, I worked on a lot of Disney stuff and uh, we do still publish our own comics now, but like I, I could see it being a valuable tool to speed up uh, some of the more tedious uh, processes in production. Like, you know, instead of drawing that background, uh, you know, a hundred times over, just like we've got a model of it or we've got the AI knows what this, you know, the interior of the bat cave looks like, and we're just going to kind of, you know, speed things up a little bit. So I think it definitely has, has value for traditional artists too. You know, and, I mean, one of the things I, you know, I didn't set out to do this to create a, uh, you know, an AI graphic novel. Um, but I, I mean, I learned so much from doing it, especially, I mean, learned about the limitations of AI. And I mean, there's so much that only a human artist can do. Yeah. One, keep people on model. I mean, mm -hmm. the characters are not on model. I mean, they're, they're I would say 90% on model, but you'll see, you know, Zeus's, you know, cape changes length or the way his, uh, you know, lightning bolt on his chest is changes. You also, you can't depict violence. I had to do a lot of cheats where one character would be punching the camera and then the next panel would be someone reacting to being punched. Um, you can't draw anything that's licensed or IP. You know, you can't draw Spider-Man or Batman. Yeah. So nothing is going to replace comic book artists. Mm. What this is, is this was a creative experiment to see if as a writer, can I use AI to express myself visually, which mm -hmm. I can't do as a writer. I didn't put any artists out of work doing this because there was no money. I spent all of my money on real art, which is actually in the book. I have a huge yeah, yeah. pitch book um, in, in the book with, with all of Axel's art as well as art that I had commissioned back in 2005. So for 20 years, I've had commissioned art, you know, renderings of characters, which is also legally how I'm able to own it too, because, mm -hmm. you know, while I might be, not be able to own like one panel of AI art, the concept is copyrighted. The characters were drawn by real, you know, artists and every page was, you know, was stitched together from, you know, anywhere from three to six, you know, images that were cropped, that were, that were, you know, color changed, that were reversed, that were, you know, all sorts, you know, I, I, I would sometimes I'd have to, you know, if I'm building a character, I might not be able to get all the details. So I'll do the lion body and then do wings separately and then just drop yeah, the yeah. body you know, Photoshop it. So there was a lot, a lot of that. Um, you know, it was not just give me this panel. I mean, right, I, right. I think 2% of the book was probably, whoa, I got the perfect panel right away. Um, so it, it was, you know, I was like, I wonder if this will work, you know, as I went and I just, I rendered the first chapter and I was like, this looks really nice. I mean, honestly, the art really is beautiful. Um, it looks, you know, there's not like weird AI, like, you know, four legs, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of stuff. Like, I mean, there, I, when I got that, I disregarded it. You know, I would render until I got something. Yeah. That, yeah. That was close. Um, the story myth wars is the, the, the story it's, it's recasting the Greek gods as superheroes. Mm -hmm. And we always look at, you know, Superman is Zeus and Aquaman is Poseidon and the flash is Mercury, you know, et cetera. The original Greek gods especially I think thanks to clash of the Titans, we look at them as just like these old fogies that sit on thrones and judge the humans in Greek mythology. There was a 10 year battle between Zeus in his prime 
against Kronos and the Titans. It's the whole opening of Disney's Hercules, if you want to yeah. check out the yeah. opening credits. That story never gets told. It's always, yeah, there was a 10-year battle between Zeus and the Titans, and Zeus won, and there was much rejoicing. Yay! I always wanted to see that story. So this is the first part of that. It is anywhere from between somewhere between eight and 18 volumes mm -hmm. uh, with this being volume one and myth wars is a much larger story than just telling the Titan alchemy, the story of the Olympians versus the Titans. There is a whole intermythological war conspiracy. This is an epic. Um, you know, I wrote it first in 2005, but I wrote the whole thing. So there is an ending. Um, this is the beginning. There's also, you know, there's a end, beginning, middle, and end. So it's, it's mm -hmm. a finite story. It's a specific story. And it involves all sorts of world mythologies, gods coming together to defeat other gods. The core of the story is the story of Zeus and the Olympians recast as teenage superheroes. So Zeus is a lightning thrower. Hades is a shadow porter. Um, you know, Apollo, Flame On. Yeah, yeah. That sounds pretty cool, actually. Lots of pop culture references. I mean, when you've got Zeus and Kronos confronting each other, you can't help but quote Empire Strikes Back. You know, you are my father. That's not true. You know, there's all sorts of stuff like that. So, which also just, you know, puts a mirror to the fact that most modern movies are just mm -hmm. retelling, you know, The Matrix, Star Wars. It's all just Greek mythology. So I very deliberately will reference movies or, you know, you know, those kind of things. So adult fans will really appreciate it. It's aimed at third through seventh graders. It's meant for fans of things like Smile and Roller Girl and Dog Man. Um, and it's and it's formatted that way. It's it's uh, five five and a half by eight inches. But it will be highly enjoyable by, you know, people like us. I mean, it, it's, it's yeah, meant yeah. To, to appeal on both those levels. Um, and I think that, you know, both adults and kids, especially who are Greek mythology fans, this story really takes those characters and brings them to life in this way that's always been there. But no one has told the story of Zeus in his prime, not as this old guy. He doesn't have a beard. I mean, he's he's got red hair and a cape. You know, he's got to learn to use his lightning powers and he's got to take down his father. It's his destiny. And, uh, you know, it's. It, it's a really, I'm talking too much, but it's available on Amazon. Okay. I'm really proud of it. And I apologize ahead of time for anyone offended that I used AI art. Yeah, that's, man, it just became such a firebrand. Like, I did not expect the AI art uh, controversy to blow up as much as it has. But yeah, Myth Wars Volume 1, Zeus, the Teenage Years on Amazon. Uh, if you're interested, guys, I can, I can put a link in the uh, show description for you, for sure. But um, yeah, I think I think AI, um, I I think it is going to become just part of the workflow. Personally, I mean, this is a this is a guy who's gone from drawing traditionally to digitally to incorporating you know Photoshop more into my work, and I I think in five or ten years time, it's just going to be part of the norm. I mean, Photoshop is already integrating AI certain AI uh, tools into it. It's just, it's, it's going to be a normal part of the creative process. Now, you know, how people are going to feel about that in five or 10 years when maybe, you know, you don't need as many artists time will, time will tell, you know, but I, I think it, it, it does open up a lot of possibilities. Cause like you said, if you've got people out there that maybe have um, some really fantastic ideas, but they can't quite visualize those ideas, you know, to be able to get that stuff out there in, in some form and be able to show other people, you know, what's in your head, I think is, is pretty cool. Yeah. You know, and thank you. Thank you. And, um, and I appreciate it, especially, you know, for yourself, who is a talented artist who I am jealous of, because I am not some of my art is in the, in the appendix too. And you can see how bad it is. Um, I tried to draw it in 2015 and failed miserably, but I put some of my images next to the AI one. I mean, like, see, this is why I, I hope that maybe it's popular enough that I can actually hire an artist or team up with an artist to draw volume two or even have volume one redrawn. I'm not opposed to any of that. This was a proof of concept. And like you said, it was a way to get this out there. I mean, it's been 25 years. I have yeah. tried every format, every possible way. And I was like, all right, I'm a writer. I can't draw. This is at least a way to get it out there and let's see what happens. And, you know, 
who knows? Yeah, that, that's kind of interesting because I can see um, I can see artists using this even in like the pre visualization phase, you know, um, yeah. to put together even just some some layout ideas or composition ideas. Because sometimes you know I struggle with with composition, and it's like okay, give me like twenty different variations of you know character jumping out of a plane into a cityscape or something, and pick the most dynamic one. Okay, that I'm going to use as a reference. And I, I guess in that regard, like how is it any different than using a photographic reference or swiping from another comic book artist? It's, it really isn't. A AI is a tool. You know, it, like AI couldn't have sold of of created Myth Wars on its own. You know, yeah. it, it couldn't write it. It couldn't render the panels. I mean, even when I tried giving it a page to see what would happen, like it was all sorts of crazy crap came out. But yeah, you know, and another way to kind of think about it is like when Jurassic Park came out in 93, I remember the, the great quote from Stan Winston when he saw the CGI models that were replacing his early Raptor puppets. He said, wow, I guess I'm extinct. And then they gave that line to Alan Grant in the movie, but that's where the line came from. And it's like, you know, when CGI came along and put, you know, the, the Ray Harryhausen's and the Stan mm -hmm. Winston's, I mean, yeah, there are still practical effects, but nobody seemed to protest that, you know, the way they are with, with still art. Uh, they were fine with, with computers creating art that moves, but if it's still art, it seems to be an issue. I don't know. Maybe I'm looking at it wrong. Um, there, there, well, there was some controversy. I know it, uh, Disney specifically with 2D animation going into 3D. And I remember a lot of artists saying, you know, 3D was never going to catch on. And a lot of that. That's a great was, one too. Yeah, you're right. The 2D yeah, it was, it was, it was fear and they weren't wrong to be afraid because, you know, 3D animation is, is a lot more technical and a lot more specialized. You have people that literally like their job is to, to animate fire or water or effects like that. You're not, you know, doing the whole scene yourself. That's a very different process. And, um, you know, then we saw not long after Toy Story that Disney pretty much just did away with, you know, most of its 2D animation. But there is a demand, a desire for that. There, there still is a demand for 2D animation. I mean, I just watched X-Men 97 this week and yeah, it was done with computers, but it was still 2D animation. It was, it was good. Um, so, you know, I think it, it is coming from a place of fear because the comic book industry right now is not in a good place financially, despite what some people want to say or claim it's not. And so the jobs are kind of fewer and further between. So people are concerned mm -hmm. that, you know, those jobs, the few jobs that are there are going to be taken. But I'm like, you know, there's always a place for fantastic art. There's always a place. I, I think what's going to happen is we're going to um, probably have, well, one of two things could happen. Either we have more books out there from people because of AI, you know, helping like fantastic creators be able to get more done, or we're going to have fewer books of a better quality anyway, just because of, you know, natural selection, because people can't afford to buy a bunch of $5 books that aren't good, <laughs> you know, every month. So it's just gonna, that's. Well, you know, and it's interesting because yes, I mean, the comic industry is clearly at least as far as, you know, the superheroes buying it from your comic book store. Yeah. But um, you have several friends of mine who are quite large in the industry have noted to me that like comics are actually selling bigger than ever now. They're just yeah. in a different format. Yes. They're at Target, Barnes and Noble, like I said, Roller Girl, Dog Band. Mm -hmm. Like kids read more comics today than they did 20 years ago. Um, which is also why I formatted Myth Wars, you know, in that format, because that's my goal is to get it to the, that audience. I, I don't think our kids ever read uh, floppy comics. I don't think they ever did. I know, you know, my daughter, she would get books from Scholastic. My son would read graphic novels or manga. Um, and even now, again, going back to the retail component of some of the things that we do, uh, I don't have a single person asking for a Marvel or DC monthly book. We do carry manga and we carry graphic novels, but no, nobody, the kids are not asking for traditional floppy comic books anymore. It's just kind of how it is, you know? Yeah. I mean, I still, you know, I, I pick up my stash, you know, every month. I like having the physical books, but it's a, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely a weird time for, as you call them, floppies. Um, I like that because I, I totally follow. Because, yes, again, my daughter, yeah, had all the graphic novels, all the Babysitter's Club, like, you know, and she loved it. But I'd give her a My Little Pony comic book comic book, and she was like, no. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
they don't hold up. You know, they, I mean, it's, it's just a lot of down, you know, and plus the cost It's like, so you're a kid, you got 10 bucks, you can buy two 22 page floppy comics, or you can buy, you know, this big, thick graphic novel or manga. I mean that, you know, <laughs> math wars, 1499. I mean, it's 221 yeah. pages. It's, can yeah. you, scroll, uh, is the screen on going to be on if you scroll down? Uh, no, no, oh, okay. but that's, that's okay. I was gonna say, cause there's some art. At the uh, if you scroll okay. down, that's all right. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna look at the art. There we you go. You can look at the art. So there's some of the art. Oh, it is nice. I mean, you know, and it's just because someone wants to do an AI comic again, yeah, it doesn't mean it's going to come out well. Um, right, right. You know, they have to have a good story that's compelling. And you know, yeah, th these pages of art that you're looking at here, and anyone, this is all on Amazon. So if you're listening at home, just go to you know, Amazon.com, type in Myth Wars, and you'll see the art. Um, you. Know, Every one those panels took hours and hours to render each. You know, it's not like I just said do this. Um, right, right. You know, so this was this was a labor of love. You know, I, that because I've been trying to do this for twenty five years and I finally hit on a way to. It was like, whoa, I'm seeing Myth Wars for the first time. That's to me what it, it was really. I was doing it for me. Yeah, I, yeah. I'd never seen my story. I'd written it. it. It's been in different formats: screenplays, comic book formats, novel formats. But I'd never visually seen it and i just kept going until it was done uh, that's pretty cool i i don't think people realize like you know again i think in five or ten years and this is coming from an artist i think it's gonna be kind of a silly argument um because i think it's going to get to a place where really the consumer is going to decide what they want and as long as the ai art is not uh you know copying somebody else's copy written trademarked art if it's a tool that's being used and it will be a tool and I guarantee you almost every piece of media, almost every piece of media that will come out within the next five to 10 years will have some kind of an AI component to it because it's going to make job uh, the job easier for creatives, you know? Uh, so I think it's going to be kind of a silly argument to look back in 10 years and be like, remember when everybody was like outraged that comic books were, were made with AI art. <laughs> it's like, it's like, remember when everybody was at, and th this was a thing. Remember when everybody was outraged that uh, artists were inking digitally and coloring digitally instead of doing it by hand. That was literally a thing. And, and then it came and when lettering fear. changed from yeah. being by hand to being yeah. by computer. I, I, you know, like I lettered this yeah. computer. Um, you know, I used a comic book font that I purchased, you know, from Blambot. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, you know, it's for, for, for the people, you know, I, I, I've seen the comments on, on my video about this on, on my subscription, on my page on the Spectra Creative channel. Um, I get it. I get why people, you know, the ethical issues and the concern about jobs and, you know, putting people out of work. But what I would just say is I spent a lot of money on real artists. Mm -hmm. I couldn't afford to have a real artist draw 221 pages, you know, Take a look at it before kind of judging. It's only 14 bucks. It's it's less than the cost of a vintage Star Wars figure. Um, you know, and I also I have a very lengthy essay I wrote at the very end about the use of AI. And I think you'll find that I agree with you, you being you know the person listening to this. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. I have the same feelings, the same trepidations. I didn't just do this to like piss, you know, so I, I I addressed it head on. It's in the it's in the book. So, and for those of you who have kids that are into Greek mythology. Man, every sixth grader that I hand this to could care less. They're like, AI, what I don't even know what that like, whatever. This just looks awesome. And they just like start tearing through it. So well, that's who's gonna decide. At the end of the day, it's gonna come down to what consumers want. And a lot of yeah. times the end product. And I know uh Asmin Gold is a, a pretty big uh Twitch streamer, and he got in a lot of trouble because there was some controversy over a PAL world which is like a Pokemon kind of knockoff game, which I think is a lot of fun, but there's some controversy that they were using AI to generate some of the, uh, the monsters. And he's like, does it matter? He said, the game's fun. You know, at the end of the day, does, does it matter Were they actually, uh, you know, was there any copyright infringement? No. And if they used a computer to help them, he said, the consumers don't care. And that's, that's probably a place we're going to get to where, I mean, cause you actually try to explain the art process to the average consumer. And they're not going to understand like, oh, okay, well, I use Manga Studio and then Clip Studio and then Photoshop with this brush and this filter. And then I put it in a PDF and then I send it to the printer. They'll be like, yeah, I don't care. <laughs> Does it look cool or not? I just want to read something. And if it visually is neat, yay. 
Yeah, pretty much. I mean, that's like most of manga is huge right now. And a lot of manga, a lot of the complaints I'm hearing about uh, Western comic book art, like using 3D assets and stuff like that. I'm like, yeah. like they've been doing it for years. They, they do it because they have to cut corners because they're cranking out like 20 or 30 pages a week, a week, you know? You know, I get it. Progress is scary. Change is scary. I assure people the use of AI art was in, in Myth Wars by me was not done. It, you know, in any way it is a negative commentary on artists, on people who have talent, which I'm jealous of. It was just a, a way of visual storytelling and it was an experiment. And uh, I'm excited to see, you know, what will happen now that it's out there and definitely excited to get it to kids. If, if you know, again, if you guys, anyone listening, if you have kids third through seventh grade, especially if they like Greek mythology and or superheroes, I know how much kids are constantly burning through those books and they're always oh, yeah. Yeah. something to read. So, Absolutely. hey. So, you know, grab a copy, ship, have a chip from Amazon. You'll have it the next day. See what they think. Enter, you know, for your kid's sake. <laughs> there you go. So what, what is next for the toy guru? What is next? Well, I am in the middle of Myth Wars volume two. I'm, I'm, I'm already working on that. Um, I actually finished the first two pages this morning um, out of 220. So that'll be coming out hopefully at the end of summer, beginning of fall. Uh, now that my YouTube channel is back in my hands, you will continue to see I do a director's commentary on the Motu Classics line going figure by figure, and I'm in the last year of that, so there'll be some exciting uh, finale videos as I wrap that up. And uh, you, for the people looking for you know assistance getting to retail, you have an idea, you have an idea for a comic, you have an idea for, I mean, I've, I've done beauty care products, I've done <laughs> industrial washing machine products. Um, but I'm, I, I have a passion for helping people connect with customers and get product to retail and help develop it. So you can check all of that out on spectrocreative.com. Okay. And of course, spectrocreative.com backslash myth wars will get you the myth wars page. There you go. And uh, yeah. And uh, ch again, check out the book. And if you've got kids, do it for the kids. <laughs> do it for the kids. <laughs> put, put your feelings aside on the AI art. Give it to a kid and bring them joy. See what happens. You know what? If you hate it, Amazon's got a great return policy. There you go. There you go. You don't have to. to keep it. There you go, guys. Well, hey, thank you so much, Scott, for coming on. Uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, definitely check out Scott's channel. It is up. It's live. And check out his website, Spectre Creative. Check out his book, Myth Wars. And uh, check us out on Spotify, Amazon, iTunes, wherever you found this podcast. We've got uh, hopefully a lot more coming. Unless something, something really bad happens. But uh, Keep no, my fingers crossed. Right. All right, guys. We'll talk later. Bye-bye. Thanks again for listening. More news and videos are available on our website at www.clownfishtv.com and on our YouTube channel, Clownfish TV. You can buy official merchandise, clownfish comic books, and more at shopclownfish.com. If you like this show, please consider subscribing and leaving us a positive review on iTunes and other podcast platforms. If you're looking to help support this show financially, go to clownfishsupport.com. If you'd like to sponsor an episode of this show, send us an email at business at webreef.io. This podcast is a production of Clownfish Studios, LLC, and Web Reef Media, proudly made in Pittsburgh, USA. 